Our next speaker uh, I'm honored to introduce is uh, Professor Helen Blau. Um, Helen is an endowed professor and director of the Baxter Laboratory for Stem Cell Biology at Stanford University. Uh, she's a member of multiple national academies and uh, part of the Regenerative Rehab Moonshot here at Stanford. So Helen, we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, it's my great pleasure to talk to you today about regenerating and uh, rejuvenating aged muscles by targeting what I've designated as a gerozyme, an enzyme with a pivotal role in aging uh, that determines whether a muscle is youthful and strong or aged and weak. First, a disclosure, I'm co-founder of two rejuvenation companies. So aging, depicted here by Gustav Klimt, you see uh, the young, whoops, you see, this is very sensitive. Ooh. Talk, talk about the very nope. This way, okay. There you go. Preview. <laughs> so the pointer is at the top? You have to point at the screen below you. But... Down here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So as you see here, um, as depicted by Gustav Klimt, uh, there's the young babe and then the vibrant mother and then decrepit aging. And the question is, does it really have to be that way? And as shown here um, in this article in Nature, we're all living longer. Our longevity is increasing, both for men and for women. But this is not increased numbers of years with quality of life. This is an increase in lifespan, but not health span. It's more years with chronic disease. And that's what we want to counter with regenerative medicine. And the focus of my lab is muscle. And muscle is, of course, important to everything you do in life. I don't have to convince this audience. Whether you're the dancer in the ballet or you're Rodin's thinker, you're using your diaphragm muscles. And if you're Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors, you're using every uh, muscle in your body to shoot those three pointers. And with aging, uh, we lose muscle mass and strength. And humans lose about 10% of their muscle mass per decade after the age of 50. And by the age of 60 or so, 5% of people have highly debilitating loss of muscle mass and strength. And by the age of 80, one third of people have clinically diagnosable sarcopenia or muscle wasting. And this is very debilitating. You have increased frailty leads to uh, difficulty in performing daily life uh, movements, like getting out of a chair. Uh, you have an increased incidence of falls. And that leads to dependency, institutionalization, and early mortality. So what can we do about that? What I'm excited to tell you about today is our discovery of this gerozyme, this pivotal regulator. And, uh, and that by inhibiting the gerozyme, the gerozyme increases in expression. It's an enzyme that increases in expression with aging. And by inhibiting its function, uh, one can rejuvenate stem cells and have better regeneration of damaged tissues and also target the muscle tissue as well and have it increase in function, as I'll show you. And the way it acts is by enhancing the body's natural healing mechanism. So what do I mean by that? Um, when you have an injury, one of the first things that happens is there's a wave of inflammation. And what we discovered is part of that wave of inflammation is prostaglandin E2, which is a metabolite. And you see that here. You have a wave of inflammation, then a wave of fibroblasts, and then the muscle stem cells are activated. And PGE2, or prostaglandin E2, um, arises from uh, membrane phospholipids. Phospholipases uh, generate various metabolites that are then converted to PGE2, as you see here. And PGE2 acts on any one of four receptors. But the one that's most active in stem cells and in muscle tissues is EP4. 
So to find out how important this pathway is, we did some experiments. But first, let me note that NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, that's like ibuprofen, that block COX-2, block that natural healing response that you have when there's an injury to your body. They block the synthesis of PGE2. So does it matter? So we did some experiments to see whether it was essential or not. So what we did uh, in our first experiment was to genetically ablate the receptor, eliminate the receptor for PGE2 on the stem cells specifically. And then after an injury to an aged mouse or young mouse in this case, uh, we looked at regeneration and strength. And as you can see here, strength drops dramatically. So if the stem cells can't sense PGE2, then they can't respond, they can't proliferate, they can't expand in numbers, they can't repair the damage, and the mouse loses strength. Uh, similarly, if a mouse experiences a damage to its muscles, and you give it an NSAID, like an ibuprofen, and you measure strength a month later, you now see, again, this dramatic loss in muscle strength. So the muscle stem cells absolutely need this pathway, this signaling pathway, this natural healing mechanism in order to divide and make enough stem cells to repair damage after injury. So this work was picked up by the New York Times, in fact, by Gretchen Reynolds, who I believe is here. And uh, the caption, as you can see, is bring on the exercise and hold the painkillers. No pain, no gain. Because if after running a marathon or after working out in the gym, you feel achy and your instinct is to pop an ibuprofen. I used to do that until we did these experiments. And now I don't. Um, put up with a little bit of that pain because uh, exercise is a form of injury. It's a healthy form of injury. It's the way you build your muscles. But you need to not block this pathway in order to build the muscles and have your stem cells expand and respond to the damage that you've induced with exercise. So having found that, we wondered, uh, we found that if we delivered PGE2 to a given muscle, we could get that muscle to be stronger. But we wanted to see if we could make all the muscles stronger, impact the entire organism. And so we looked at the pathway. And what we found is that uh, there's this degrading enzyme, PGDH, 15 PGDH. And we wondered if we block that degrading enzyme, just inhibit it a bit with a small molecule inhibitor, could we raise PGE2 levels systemically and affect all the muscles of the body? This PGDH degrades the prostaglandin E2 naturally. So when we did that, you can see here uh, that we were able to restore the PGE2 levels in an aged mouse to be comparable with that of young. So we just modulated the levels back to a youthful level, to the level it would see when it was young. And we were really struck by the effect this had. You can see here that there's a, an increase in the mass of the muscle, the size of the muscle in the aged mouse. And if you look at the strength after one month of treatment, daily treatments for one month, uh, you see now in young as well as in aged, so young have less of the enzyme, but they do have some, and if you treat uh, the young or the aged mice for one month daily with the inhibitor, you now see this dramatic increase in strength and also in endurance. So time to exhaustion running on a treadmill, which suggests that more than just muscle is involved in this kind of rejuvenation response or increased enhanced function. And what struck us about, and why I call this a pivotal regulator, we overexpressed the enzyme in young muscles. We, we gave a gene therapy treatment to a young mouse where we expressed the uh, enzyme at a higher level in their muscles. And what we found is we do increase the levels, and as a result, you reduce PGE2 50%, just as you do with aging. And what we found then was that uh, the muscles lose um, strength, and they lose mass. In other words, one month of expression of this single enzyme results in the muscles 
shrinking and weakening. It's that potent. I, I was really blown away by that result. I didn't think that a single regulator could have such a potent effect. So if we inhibit it, we gain strength in aged. And if we overexpress it in young, we can mimic aging in one month by simply expressing this in the muscle. So what is it doing to the tissue? It's turning off a number of deleterious pathways. It's turning off ubiquitin ligases that arise with aging and degrade your proteins. And it turns off TGF beta signaling. But one of the most dramatic things it does is rejuvenate your mitochondria. You see that the tissue is, here you have an aged tissue with vacuous, distended mitochondria. After one month of treatment of the age, this looks like a young tissue. It's remodeled. The myofibrils are nicely aligned. The mitochondria are condensed, and, uh, and they also function better. We did a number of studies. And there's an increase in autophagy, which leads to this tissue remodeling and mitochondrial biogenesis, increased numbers and function of the mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouses of the skeletal muscle. So just to summarize, um, what I've shown you is that PGE2 that's part of this natural healing mechanism uh, maintains muscles, and it also plays a very important role in regeneration of damaged muscles and can rejuvenate aged muscles. And it is so potent because it's part of this natural inflammatory uh, response to injury. It promotes the proliferation, survival, and uh, restoration of muscle, regeneration of muscle by the stem cells. And it's a double whammy. It acts on the stem cells, and it also acts on the muscle tissue. And it's, uh, what I like is that it's, it's physiologic. You're modulating the levels back to a youthful level, so something that the body saw before. And so it's a physiologic regulation. It's a kind of master regulator of muscle strength in that uh, if you overexpress that enzyme, you cause young muscles to age. And in, importantly, we see that in mice, one month of treatment causes a 15% increase in muscle strength. If that translates to people, it'll be super exciting uh, because we know that humans lose 10% of their muscle mass and strength uh, per decade after the age of 50. It's very hard to maintain it, almost impossible to increase it. And so we're hoping that this will be a therapeutic approach to muscle wasting due to immobilization or to aging. And uh, we're hoping to find out in people. And then I want to uh, acknowledge the work that we're doing with the Wusai um, Foundation's Performance Alliance's help. We're working with uh, Professor Deborah Cato here, who's a geriatrician at Stanford. And we're looking to see if this is a novel biomarker, this 15 PGDH, whether you can find it in the blood and would it be a predictor of what's happening in the muscle. So I think that will be a, a very interesting finding that we're doing with the uh, Generous Foundation funding. And uh, then I just want to acknowledge the people who contributed to this work, very talented group, and here's the Wusai Foundation funding. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.